Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you here in person. And though I cannot see you joining us online, thank you for being here with us. Um, my name is Cole Thomas Reedus, And besides being a volunteer member of the uh, member-led arts forum here at the Commonwealth Club of California, I'm also the educational content curator in the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Community at San Francisco Opera. And we are here today to talk about Frida and Diego, icons in art, fashion, and of course, now opera. Thanks to the new production at San Francisco Opera by Gabriela Elena Frank and Nilo Cruz, El Ultimo Sueño de Frida and Diego. Excuse me, Frida y Diego, I keep doing that. Um, we've got a great panel with us here today. Um, our scholar in residence for this production at San Francisco Opera is conductor Jessica Bejarano, who is the conductor and founder of the San Francisco Philharmonic. She's also been giving a great pre-opera talk before each performance. If you haven't had a chance to watch that, go on to sfopera.com and click on Frida y Diego, and her talk is available to listen to there. Um, then online with us, we have uh, Dr. Stephanie J. Smith, who is a scholar of Frida and Diego. Uh, Stephanie is an associate professor of Latin American and Mexican art history at Ohio State University and the author of The Power and Politics of Art in Post-Revolutionary Mexico. And then with us is our costume designer for Frida and Diego. We have Eloise Kazan, who is award-winning production designer, set designer, and costume designer. And here with us in person, we have uh, local, locally based native Mexican artist Arlene in Correa Valencia. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, for those of you in our live audience, I'd like to just take a real quick survey. How many of you have seen the opera El Ultimo Sueño de Frida y Diego? Wow, almost all of you. That is so wonderful. Those of you that did not raise your hand, do you have a ticket for our final performance coming up this weekend? Okay, good, because if you don't, like Anne said, it is sold out. As of this morning, there were six tickets left. Wow. A few hours ago, there were two tickets left, and I checked on my taxi ride over here, and there are no tickets left. Um, and how exciting is that? That um, It's great to see that happening in opera again. Um, and there will be uh, standing room tickets available. If you are hoping to snag one of those, please get there early. I believe the box office opens at 10 a.m. I would suggest being there at 10 a.m. if you want to make sure you get one of those coveted tickets to see this really fantastic, groundbreaking, and so important opera. Uh, this has been part of our centennial season, 100 years at San Francisco Opera. And in our 100 years, this is the first time we are presenting an opera in the Spanish language, and the first time we are presenting an opera oh. composed by a woman. Absolutely. Sorry it took us so long, but we got there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're here to talk about fashion and art and all things Frida and Diego, but mostly Frida. Um, and I want to start by um, passing it off to Dr. St uh, Stephanie Smith, who is going to talk to us, just give us some historical context on Frida and Diego and their art. Welcome, Stephanie. Mm, thank you so much. Um, I, I have to say it's an honor and a pleasure to be part of this amazing panel. Um, so I'm an historian uh, from the Ohio State University, as you just mentioned, and I work on the history of the Mexican Revolution culture and gender. But I also wanted to mention that before I became an historian, I also was an artist and I lived in New York City for um, 12 years. Um, I'm now writing a new book on Frida Kahlo, uh, besides my second book. So my second book, The Power and Politics of Art in Post-Revolutionary Mexico, had some discussion of Frida Kahlo, um, but my new book um, is um, going to be, of course, all about Frida Kahlo. So it's titled Through Frida's Eyes, Frida Kahlo, Politics and the Creative Women Who Radicalized um, Mexico. And I also just want to add that I recently appeared in a BBC documentary, Becoming Frida Kahlo, um, which pre pre premiered in the UK in March. Um, so as a result of the research for this book, there are a few conclusions about Kahlo and fashion that I'd, I'd love to share for today. Frida Kahlo died in 1954, but all these years later, her love of fashion still speaks to us in, in so many ways. Kahlo's colorful self-portraits demonstrate the importance of clothing, jewelry, and adornments of all kind to the painter. And in 2004, 
Researchers also experienced the thrill of opening Kahlo's locked bathroom, located in her lifelong home, the, the Blue House. Inside, they discovered um, an extraordinary collection of Kahlo's personal possessions, including, of course, her beautiful embroidered blouses, but even her makeup and like her pawns uh, cold cream that had been locked away since her death. These items are now being exhibited, much to the delight of thousands and thousands of viewers uh, across the world. And we all had the pleasure of observing the stunning costumes designed for this magnificent opera, El Ultimo Sueño de Frida y Diego. It was a joy to see the impressive ways in which the costumes reflected um, Frida Kahlo's paintings and her life. Born in 1907, Kahlo grew up profoundly influenced by the Mexican Revolution that radically impacted the country, principally from 1910 to 1917, but of course, well beyond. However, she attempted to control her own narrative and fashion provided a wonderful way to do just that. Appearances mattered to her, and Kahlo's friends even remembered that on the days that she wasn't expecting company, she still would slip on her rings and her necklaces, make sure her hair was properly styled, and choose a beautiful outfit for the day. And even after one of her many operations, her sister Christina would put on uh, Kahlo's makeup before anyone else was allowed to see her. And um, she also helped Kahlo dye her hair. Beyond her passion for simply dressing up, Kahlo also highlighted her identity and stressed her sense of nationalism through her use of clothing. She especially enjoyed wearing embroidered blouses and long skirts that originated from different parts of Mexico, including, of course, the state of Oaxaca. While living in the U.S., Kahlo delighted in wearing her clothing um, from Mexico to create a dazzling outward image and one that often attracted the attention of people on the street. Um, Kahlo related just this in November 1930 when she wrote her mother from San Francisco saying that the women there were, and here I quote, impressed by the dresses and shawls that I brought with me. My jade necklaces are amazing for them. During her visit to France in 1939 for her exhibit there, she also attracted the attention of fashion designers who admired her sense of style. Scholars further have discussed the ways Kahlo used her clothing to hide, uh, to cover her wounded body and the effects of the polio she contracted at the age of six, but also by the catastrophic trolley accident she suffered in 1925 when she was 18. And in fact, Kahlo later said that she never forgot the moment when as a young child, a teacher um, demanded that she hide her thinner right leg with a skirt, a long skirt during a school play. As she grew older, lovely long skirts continued to hide her leg and the heels of her shoes and her bright uh, boots, sometimes with little bells, counteracted the height differential of her limbs. She also skillfully incorporated rings and necklaces and flowers in her hair to draw the viewer's eyes upward. Um, Kahlo even covered the mini class, pastor, cla uh, pastor cast she was forced to endure following um, numerous surgeries with her own lush, but often political images. Flaunting the narrow confines of gender, Kahlo occasionally dressed in men's clothing without shame. For example, by wearing a man's suit during a family portrait in 1926. Dressing in pants effectively hid her lower body, but her lively behavior displayed to all who stared but she cared very little about their opinions. For Kahlo, her outward fashion demonstrated her obsession with radical politics. For example, when Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera first met in 1928, Rivera's assistant described Kahlo as a young painter who had short hair, quote, like a boy's. And she also wore blue jeans and a man's shirt with a red star pinned to the front. She also loved her um, leather jacket too. In 1928, Rivera painted Kahlo in a similar in similar attire and with short hair in his mural panel, the distribution of arms in the Ministry of Education. But by August 1929, Kahlo and Rivera posed for their wedding portrait, um, where we can see that she wore ribbons in her longer hair, jewelry, and a uh, rebozo. Um, from this point forward, 
for the most part, she favored her embroidered blouses um, and long skirts. However, in 1934, after Carlo discovered uh, Rivera's affair with her sister, Christina, she again cut her hair in a bob and wore modern clothing. And in 1940, she also painted self-portrait with cropped hair after Rivera asked for a divorce um, the previous year. Here she displays her short hair and dresses in a man's gray suit, which was probably Rivera's suit. And I have to add that we wonder, we uh, saw this painting wonderfully represented in the opera. To the very end, Kahlo appreciated the deep ties that united death and rebirth through revolution. Much like the Mexican printmaker Jose Guadalupe Posada's fanciful skeletons, including the magnificent Katrina, who we just met in the opera as well, Carlos sketched her own dancing skeletons in her diary in the days uh, just before her death, once again revealing her passion with clothing. And even as she contemplated her own demise, Carlo drew the lively symbols of death and rebirth dressed in the same long, full skirts that she herself wore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And when can we expect your book out on the shelf? <laughs> well, it's under contract with UNC Press, which has published my previous um, two books. Uh, and it's due, um, the contract is due in September, but I think it's not going to happen quite so soon, <laughs> soon though, <laughs> in theory. Maybe by, um, I don't know, January. <laughs> Already, so too late for a stocking stuffer, but we will uh, wait with big yeah. breath for that publication. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to note that Stephanie is thank joining you. us on Zoom from Paris, where it is almost <laughs> three in the morning. So thank you so much for staying up with us this evening, Stephanie. <laughs> it was my pleasure, to, seriously, to be a part of this panel. It was, it was wonderful, wonderful to watch the opera. Absolutely. And we're so lucky to have the costume designer with us, Eloise Kazan, who is joining us from Mexico City. How is the weather in Mexico City today, Eloise? Well, today is good, but it's been so hot in the last week has been record uh, temperatures, so it's been a bit too much for us. Well, send some of that weather this way, please. It's, we've, <laughs> we've been enjoying the June gloom here in San Francisco. <laughs> um, Eloise, your, your work for this opera is just so phenomenal. Um, as I've said to you before, it almost steals the show, and the only reason that it does not steal the show is that everything else in the opera is just so fabulous. Uh, of course, at San Francisco Opera, we hope that all the factors in all of our productions are equally fabulous, but that is not always the case. Uh, but I just absolutely love your costumes. So please take it away. Tell us about your work, your designs for this opera. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you. So, well, I wanted to talk a bit, not just about this opera, but um, I have had the joy really and the pleasure of designing pieces that are inspired by Mexico and that talk about Mexico many times. And I feel that in a way it's you know, all helped me, that process and those experiences in those other shows have helped me do Frida now and understand this design better. And I just wanted to uh, share with you a little presentation about, you know, bringing in Mexico and how designers really um, digest all that research and all, all that work that uh, people like Stephanie do and all the scholars do and how we digest it, mix it in with other stories and, you know, tell what needs to be told on stage so it's um, you'll see I, I talk about other shows but it's all about Mexico and does in, in the end I will share some okay great so <laughs> now we'll go, go back to so this was the research I was talking okay. about and about doing those color palettes and material palettes and how those so those the, the images above show you know the, the initial palettes then you have the drawings and then a few pictures of what the show actually looked like and these are the roughs I was talking about, and you know, doing this Elizabeth, mix of Elizabethan with pre Columbian. And these are some images of the Elizabethan headdresses put next to some, some ideas of things that could look pre Columbian. And this is why I talked about it uh, as a silhouette. I don't know if you can hear our audience, but they are loving, loving your work. <laughs> there are oohs and ahs all around. Uh, so yeah, so this is one of, and this is how it all kind of came together in that. And so, for example, you know, 
I felt that it was, you know, you can definitely, I hopefully, I got this uh, feel of it being Mexican and pre-Columbian, but at the same time, it could be Tudor, it could be, they mix on the, so another thing which I love mixing and have done a lot, many times, and uh, that Stephanie talked about is, I always think that one of the fantastic things, and they were so fashionable and so, looked so amazing, all the Mexican revolutionaries and soldaderas, so I found that as a huge inspiration, and we have some soldaderas and revolutionaries in appearing in Frida. But this motive of the cartridge belt and um, it has it's something that I've worked with many times. But I do think it it has been something that is present in my work over and over again, just because of those images of the revolutionaries in Mexico. So this is, for example, again from the stat show, uh, a soldier in every sun at the RSC. So again, a character that was supposed, uh, you know, an Aztec, but you know, again, I, even though obviously I don't like to be, I don't always think, and for this show, I don't think we didn't want to be precise in period. So it was all a mix of periods and just having that general feel. These are the costumes from that show in an exhibition. But, and this is a character from that show, which I feel is a bit of a grandfather to a character that appears at the very end of, of uh, Frida, which is Mixtlantecuhtli, the god of the underworld. And I feel that, you know, one of the themes that I kind of have explored in costumes over the years and have had the, the joy of kind of designing with is the Tzampantli, which is these um, racks or walls of skulls that, you know, can, um, that are um, that uh, you had in pre-Hispanic Mexico, and this is from the ruins of uh, Templo Mayor in, in Mexico City, and this is uh, um, from a codex, and this is a character from that appears in the very end of the opera, the gold of the underworld, and I again I tried you know kind of incorporating those skulls into his headdress, and that costume was very much inspired by by those pieces. So you can see that here. This is the final scene of the opera, and here it is there. This is um, Katrina, but this is her costume uh, of Cuatlicue. Uh, Lorena, the director, felt that it was very, very important to have a pre-Hispanic uh, side of Katrina shown in the show, and she, she uh, selected Cuatlicue as a pre-Hispanic deity to correspond to that. It's a goddess of... Uh, uh, fertility, but at the same time destruction. She's represented always with this snake skirt, and you'll see, for example, I jumped over, but this is a, a very famous um, sculpture in, that can be seen in the Mexican uh, Anthropology Museum here in Mexico City. And so, really, really I think this was very much an inspiration for, for that costume. But, you know, I did want to, the snakes to be a bit more readable, but we did copy to some degree some of the parts. And again, there is a mix of uh, Posadas, Katrina, uh, Stephanie already mentioned, uh, Posada, uh, the Mexican artist Posada, and also Diego, who actually was the first one who showed her in full in full costume. So he was the, really her first costume designer. And yeah. so here is Diego Rivera's, and this is Posada's Katrina. And, you know, I kind of mixed on in all these elements, but in the end, you have to do a reinterpretation. I was trying to keep close, obviously, to the one that is shown in the Diego's mural. But, you know, you kind of do your, your version. I, I wanted her to have a bit of the orange because that's the world, the, the color of the underworld. I love the idea, and we always try to incorporate those uh, kind of things in my costumes, which is little kind of secret details. She, all the lace is skull shaped on her dress, and uh, you, you, she has, you know, obviously the the Katrina parts, but she does have little things that kind of hopefully remind us of that snake uh, version of her. This is also a, pr a picture from the production. I just wanted to very briefly also talk about why we decided on that color scheme in, in Frida and Diego, which is the orange for the underworld, the world of the dead, and the blues for the uh, for the world of the living. I think, you know, really it was as bold as that combination is. It came really naturally. I do remember my um, grandmother used to do um, 
altars for the Day of the Dead, and they were always very orange because of the marigolds. But for example, at least in Mexico City, I, do, I don't think that's true for all cities, but you do kind of, you go to the markets, local markets, and everyone is selling the marigolds. So you do feel that the city becomes a bit orange. And you also have that orange, which I think for all of us, somehow those, uh, you know, the, or the marigolds with the candles, uh, in the cemeteries, you kind of do feel that the Day of the Dead was natural coral for it to be orange. And, you know, you have all these images from from the cemeteries at the Day of the Dead in Mexico City. And they, I feel, look, you know, so we try to bring that to stage and and do something. This is a sketch of our set designer, Jorge Ballina, and with all the costumes, and it just shows a bit our first sketches and ideas of how we talked about putting this all together. This, these are some first sketches for the chorus and for Frida. And one of the things, again, that was really important for us is to bring, you know, and this is one thing that Diego did very much in his murals, is mix all those times and show the history of Mexico. And we wanted to have all these characters from different periods mixing in in the world of the dead because they all died in different periods of course so you have you know the uh, you have the spaniards and the conquistadors you have the mexican revolutionaries you have some characters that are obviously my version of why people think that the pre-hispanic mexico should or look like and so you have all these things blending some of them very european others were others uh, you know very uh, Mexica, very Aztec, some Mayan, but all that mix, which I think, but, and again, also in the world of art, it mixes again. But Frida, what I think always, and what I think was wonderful is that I feel that she herself was a costume designer. And what I mean by that is that I think that costume designer is not someone who just thinks about fashion, but someone who understands this clothes tell a story that you can um, connect with other people through it. You can tell your, your about your origins and tell your story and show things, highlight things, mask and mask with clothing. And I think she was very, very acutely aware of that. And that it only not only that she was very aware of how that represents you as a person, of how it can connect you with other person or disconnect you with other people, or how it can uh, tell about your uh, pain, traumas, uh, you know, uh, and where you come from, et cetera, et cetera. She also kind of painted, she was obviously, because she, she has all those paintings of her, obviously the clothes are such an important part of, of her art. And I wanted to show some other costumes that I did for other shows that were inspired for Frida, completely different. This uh, costume on the left is from uh, Titus Andronicus, and it's Lavinia. It's a character who is raped and her tongue and hands are cut out, uh, are cut. And I, you know, I, you know, as soon as I read that, I felt that she had to have something that would be inspired by Frida because at the end of the day, she was talking about pain. She could not talk anymore through her language. So I felt she would paint in a way, what she, her pain. So I felt it was very natural that in a way her costume had to be connected in some way with Frida. And so Frida ended up in this shishi piece and uh, you know, all uh, uh, Frida also has this light motif of the veins and that, that, that you know, um, and that connect either family or um, that that connect stories and characters. And I felt that this, you know, um, it, she also has that painting which is with all the roots. And I felt this very much was adequate for that character. This is something else. This is a costume I did for uh, the Day of the Dead celebrations in Mexico City for the parade in the city. And here, the, the heart appears really as a map of Mexico. So that was another vision. But again, all these pieces were really inspired very much by, by the painting of the two Fridas, which uh, this is another piece which I had to do also, another Frida, which I had to do for, for something else. This, is, um, this was a Mexican tourist show, actually. And the, the, the idea was to find a painting by Frida, that to it, it be inspired by a painting of Frida, but also uh, by some other Mexican art tradition uh, and you know so they just gave me a painting and uh, I connected this painting with the monjas coronadas in Mexico which are the crown nuns all these portraits that you have in and you can always see and it's I think very much a very Mexican thing so we, I, I did that costume and this is another one which was actually based on the Casa Sur. So I started just with that color. And then it was about the Mexican Talavera, uh, the Mexican ceramics. 
But again, it was inspired by Frida. And then I just wanted with this whole come back to that blue, which is the color of the living in the opera. And which obviously, you know, very much comes from her house. And I do feel also blue was a very important color in her palette. This is the very first, like, just sketch drawing that we did, just kind of to have something. So, you know, Jorge did the, the frames that he already felt that we needed to have those frames and the painting and those colors present. And then I started drawing in the characters that we, we felt would be important. So this is, you know, I just wanted to show again, you know, how you, oh, this is what Frida painted, but then you kind of, I did want it to be as close to it as possible, but I also wanted to bring a bit of that skull and the idea of Katrina that we have. Lorena did have a feeling that they should very much be equal. And maybe in Katrina, in a way, could even be another face of Frida, which I thought was a very interesting idea. And as a costume designer, you also have to do all these, you know, um, drawings with and without the accessories and so on. This is another costume which I really love in the show, which is based on the Tijuana um, traditional dress from the Oaxaca region in Mexico. And so this is Frida's very well-known painting. And this is a very traditional um, dresses. And I ended up doing this one, which um, I hopefully is, a, is, you know, a, again, a blend of the traditions and uh, my, my own version. So you do end up mixing things that are tradition and that are Frida and a bit of you yourself. This is something that Stephanie also talked about and is the plaster corsets that she had to wear because of her accident and all that she went to. So I did this costume that we call the plaster corset costume. And it is very much inspired by, by the plaster corset that Frida had, but it also kind of, I looked a lot at the, at the diary and her drawings and, you know, all the writings that she did. So I kind of, we did the skirt with all the pages. We did recreate the, the, the boot and the artificial leg for that. I also love the idea of incorporating a bit of a wing, you know, in that famous Frida um, phrase of what do I need feet for when I have wings to fly? And Again, I came back to the idea of how Frida has become so many different things for different people and how she has evolved with times and how you have maybe a anchor of future Frida or some different Frida and how she would have expressed herself in a different period. So we just kind of felt that that was also necessary. And this is uh, the, the, the drawings I did for, for the main costumes for Frida and Diego. And just not to leave Diego completely out of this, one obviously very important uh, piece in the second act is the Alameda mural. And we did want to, you know, we didn't want to do an exact recreation of it. So it's a version of it, but we did separate some characters that we felt were important to have. Obviously, Katrina had to be there. We did want to show um, some Hispanic characters, which we already had before. And we did want to show the Spanish uh, Mexico as well. So we have the conquistadors, we have the Viceroy of Spain. We have a very, uh, an amazing Mexican uh, poet and artist as well, who um, uh, uh, I think was very inspiring for Frida as well, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. And this is how it kind of looked a bit in, in the opera in the end. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Eloise. Thank you. And I'm, I'm so glad you all are clapping. I was about to comment that in uh, it's a tradition at the opera that only on the first opening night does the creative team actually get to come out and be part of the curtain calls and take a bow. And Eloise, I think you deserve one more round of applause and one more bow, so please. <laughs> because after opening night, we're already designing the next show. <laughs> so. All right. Well, we've also got people here on the stage with me here in San Francisco. Um, and we have uh, native Mexican artists and now locally based in the Bay Area, Arlene Correa Valencia. Welcome, Arlene. Um, I would love for our audience to hear about the work that you do. Um, and before you do that, though, I would love for you to just talk a moment about, as a contemporary Mexican artist, what does Frida mean to you? Who is she? How does she inspire you or not inspire you? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm, I'm going to answer that 
that's backwards fine. That's because fine. I feel like <laughs> in order to to be able to share what my experience or my connection to Frida is, um, I also have to I have to share who I am and how I came to this country and what my position has been here. And so, um, my I actually grew up in Napa Valley. Um, how many of you have visited? up in Napa, yeah, everyone, right? Who doesn't want to? So um, I grew up in Napa and my family came here 27 years ago. I'm almost 30 and so I was three years old when I came to this country. And unfortunately my family was fleeing violence and poverty and so I came here undocumented. Um, and I grew up in Napa, which is very predominantly white and, and brown. Um, and there's this harsh divide between wealth and, and poverty um, and almost nothing in between, right? And so my childhood was extremely traumatic and it was a lot about erasure and um, erasing who I was, erasing my roots um, and learning how to become one of you, learning how to erase my language so that I wouldn't be seen as undocumented um, and so that I would protect myself and protect my family from being sent back to, to our home country. Um, and, you know, as a child, I never understood why we couldn't be in our home country, but I knew that all of the things that I heard about it, it was just dangerous, right? And so I remember I remember being um, in grade school and having huaraches at home and not wanting to wear them because I knew that that would be an identifier of, of my status and that that could be a reason why we were deported, right? And as, as a child, politics, I mean, politics are still so confusing for every one of us, right? Um, but as a child, it's just a harsher reality and you also see your friends wearing different clothing, um, acting a different way, talking about different things that both socially and culturally maybe you're not attuned to. And so um, unfortunately, because we grew up so poor, I didn't have access to the opera. I didn't have access to ballet. I saw my first ballet last year um, or this year. And so uh, arts in itself was not accessible at all. Uh, I was very, very fortunate that my father had a huge interest in art. And so I, I learned painting through him. Um, and he knew almost nothing and everything he knew he had learned from the world and from being a house painter and so he would come home and teach me and I learned that if I was interested in the arts my father would have a conversation with me and so art became mode of communication and a way to break the tradition of fathers not being um, more present for their children right in Mexican traditional Mexican homes there's more of an expectation of the mother to care for the children and to provide for the children and the family and so I knew that the arts would would break that tradition with my father and I pretended to care about art and now I'm a full-time artist um, <laughs> which is great because I, I love what I do um, and I wouldn't change it and so you know growing up here I, I didn't well, I didn't come to the D Young or the SF MoMA until late in high school um, and my first time walking into the D Young the first thing I realized was that nobody looked like me um, and that there was nothing on the walls that reflected my family and then I started learning about Frida and and yeah, Diego and how could you not write? They're the icons of Mexico. And while I find them problematic in many ways, I do admire them and I have to acknowledge who they are and what the role that they've played, um, not only in my life, but in all of Mexican culture, right? Because the little, the little access that native and indigenous people have to the arts is through a visual language. And I, I recently, I got a green card this year. And so I've been traveling back to Mexico now. And I was fascinated that in Mexico City, when you go to their subway system, they don't have signs as like, you know, this is Powell Street or Embarcadero. They have uh, they have symbols for, for stops, right? And th that's so hard for me to understand because of course I want to see the vocabulary, but I, I thought it was fascinating that they used um, drawings and symbols because that is what native people understand, right? It's a universal language. Art is a universal language. And, and I think that is so powerful and so incredible. And so I know that the very little that my father taught me came from the visual that he was able to learn, right? And so he learned from Frida, he learned from Diego, he learned through osmosis, through the visual, the things that he could teach me. And I, I am just deeply inspired by Frida on so many levels, not only as a painter, um, but just as someone that can wear their, their identity and can wear their culture with so much pride. Obviously, I'm extremely tattooed now um, because at, a, at, a, at 18 years old, I decided that I would no longer um, try to cover myself up anymore and that I was going to make myself as Mexican as you possibly 
possibly could could see, right? And so I've embarked on this journey of uh, 10 years of, of tattooing my entire body with um, Mexica stories and the stories of my father's ancestors. Uh, and, and it's been really, really incredible and so healing. And I imagine that it's in the same language that Frida um, wore all of these textiles and was so proud of Mexico and was so proud of everyone in Oaxaca and everyone across the country who so laboriously put their, their love and their, their culture into the weaving and into the embroidery. Um, and for her to come to San Francisco and come to the United States and share that with people uh, is just incredible. I'm so proud that Frida has become so, uh, somewhat of a, um, a representation of our culture, right? But one of the things that we were speaking about earlier is, is that my frustration comes that from the fact that a lot of people I've noticed um, use Frida as an entry point to the textiles, right? And then uh, for me, I feel like there's a, a conversation that must be had beyond that. Like who, not only like how do we wear these textiles, how do we commercialize them, and how do they exist in capitalism, but what, how do they affect Native people? What does it mean for a white person to wear a textile um, that is made by, the, by a Native person, but if a Native person wears that textile, they are murdered, or they are treated as less than, or they are just um, you know pushed away from society because they are brown. I think we all have different levels of privilege and being aware of, of how we um, engage with not only fashion, but our politics and our language and our, the way that we embrace other cultures is really important. And in a lot of my work, um, I use the colors of, the, of labor in Napa. For those of you that have been going through Napa, you see a lot of these bright oranges and bright yellows, which are the safety vests for the people that work in the vineyards. And so I've actually taken um, the vests themselves and deconstructed them and created sweatshirts and t-shirts that say we are not invisible, somos visibles, to take a stand on visibility and to talk about what it means to be visible in this political time, um, and especially in f and from 2016 until now, right? Thinking about what it meant to be undocumented and what it meant to be targeted because of, of how we came to this country. And so that's a little bit of, of what I do. I welcome you all to uh, visit Catherine Clark Gallery this fall. I'm having a, a solo exhibition there in August, and you'll be able to see more of the textile works that where I deconstruct um, not only clothing that my family has worn, but clothing that all of my community in Napa has worn. And I use that to recreate portraits of um, undocumented people and, and Latinx folks in, in the community. Wow, wonderful. Thank you. Powerful. Well, with that, I'm going to pass it on to our San Francisco Opera Scholar in Residence for Frida Diego, Jessica Bejarano. Hi, Jessica. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Like, listening to your story, I kind of felt like, you know, I, it's, it's my story, very, very similar. Um, I'm first generation Mexican American. And when my family immigrated from Mexico to, you know, uh, San Diego, LA, uh, we left, my family left all of that behind the clothing, the culture, the language. They tried to Americanize us as much as possible so that we can easily assimilate and live up quote unquote, better life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't know about Frida Kahlo. I didn't know about, you know, our songs and, you know, our folk tunes and our, our family stories. I didn't know about any of that. And so, you know, being, you know, a scholar in residence, um, you know, with um, El Ultimo Sueño de Frida and Diego, I've been able to do a lot of research and really dig in and just be like, oh my God, our culture is so beautiful. It's so rich and it's so amazing. And, you know, I want to now be very proactive in trying to find ways to preserve it and, you know, and, and show more more of my culture um, as a conductor, as a human being, and, and as an artist. You know, I'm the conductor uh, of the San Francisco Philharmonic and, um, and other orchestras, you know, throughout, you know, the past 15 years professionally. And when I tell people I'm a conductor, they're like, oh, choo-choo trains? <laughs> <laughs> because how dare a Mexican woman be a conductor of opera and orchestra? So they always think, like, I'm a train conductor. I'm like, no, orchestras, music. And it's just like, wow, you know? And so it's interesting because as a professional, you know, conductor musician, people can't fathom that I'm a conductor. And then my Mexican family who are immigrants, they look at me and they can't fathom that I'm a conductor. So it's just like, I don't really fit into that world with my family. Cause they're like, how did you become a conductor? Like we didn't grow up in opera, ballet, symphony. The first time I ever heard classical music was my first year in college. I was 18 years old and I was like, oh my God, what is wow. this? Um, and, and same thing, you know, like, you know, when I go to the opera or ballet, you know, people look at me and they're like, you know, what are you doing here? You know, like, are you 
you an usher? Are you, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's very interesting. So my question for all of you, you know, it's for me, I've, I've learned so much about myself um, throughout this process and being with SF Opera, which is an absolute honor. Um, you know, what can we do to preserve our culture, to preserve our stories, to preserve, you know, um, you know what, what we wear, what, what was worn then, what we can wear now, what we should wear, like how can we preserve this beautiful culture a bit more? or a lot more. Who wants to start off there? Eloise, do you want to respond to that first? You can say no if you prefer. <laughs> no, I, I think it's, well, I, I think it's wonderful that we, first of all, I think it's important not to look at it as just something that you can um, uh, see on an opera stage or where, or, but it's something that's very much part of life in so many, in so many ways. So I think just making it part of your life in many ways, you know, I just, uh, I, I think that's probably the, the way to preserve it. And, um, you know, it's very interesting for me to hear, uh, Jessica and uh, you know what she said about her because i you know i come from a family in mexico that and my I'm, my mother's croatian and my father's mexican and i feel that everyone was so loud about you know their in heritage and about the traditions and my grandmother because she felt my mother was Croatian and she was not going to teach me she was very loud about you know why the dead of the day of the dead and why we need to do this and she would explain everything to me so i think that those things are wonderful and uh, to, you know to just even pass i really well, i feel that for me the most valuable things were, were exactly those that you know just passed through family and that i heard from from people around me so i think that's that's beautiful Thank you. And, and Stephanie, with, with the hindsight, the 2020 vision hindsight of history, how do you respond to that question? Well, um, I wanted to say I really very much appreciated um, the discussion. And I think, you know, what I can think of is that um, when, for example, I went to see the Frida Kahlo exhibit at um, the Brooklyn uh, BAM or the Brooklyn um, Museum of Art. And it was interesting because the lines were, you know, <laughs> around the block <laughs> to get in. There were so many people standing in line. And what was interesting to me is that um, they had a certain notion of freedom, uh, that, that they had an idea, but they, they really didn't understand much about her. You know, like, for instance, I heard um, someone say as I was walking out, well, did you know that... Um, she was a communist for a while, for example. And so I think, um, I think, I think one thing is, uh, is to maybe understand more deeply who Frida and Diego are, you know, beyond, beyond the, I think as, as we were just discussing sort of the capitalist uh, version of them, you know, that we can sell on cups. So who, you know, and I think, you know, that's through art and through writing and, um, music and the opera and and paintings as well thank you and arlene uh, yeah I, you know i think it's a, a really important question to ask ourselves regardless of where we come from and regardless whether you know you're black brown white yellow i don't know um whatever you identify with it's important for you to think about what you want to pass on and what you want to be held on what's important to you what traditions you want and um i i think one of the the points that connects me deeply to frida is that i also unfortunately cannot have children um and i contemplate with that because i i make a lot of work about children and family separation and um, I, I really connect with her in that sense of what it must what it feels like right to to have to go through life knowing that you will never procreate and the expectations of a Mexican woman um, that you know all those complex complex things of like the moms my mom constantly being like and when are the kids coming and are you pregnant and and you know this this constant conversation um and so unfortunately that is a reality for me but i i am so blessed that to have nieces and nephews and i know that everything that i'm working towards is for them to learn who they are right i create these paintings and i i take them to museums so they can learn who they are and so that they don't have to be ashamed of who they are and they can travel the world saying like i 
celebrate the Day of the Dead and I, um, I have these tattoos and this is what it means in my culture. Um, and they don't have to do the work that I did as a child, right? They don't have to reverse that so that they can walk, the, they can walk just a straight path and, um, and have their, their culture on their shoulders. And so uh, for me, it's always about the next generation. It's planting the seed, right? It's, it's knowing that we're going to plant a seed that we're never going to eat from um, and that we're never going to enjoy those fruits because they're for our grandchildren and they're for for their children. And so in my family, and I know, I know for us, there's been a heavy focus on our children um, more so than ourselves right now. Thank you so much. Um, we want to leave some time for audience questions, but please uh, have another question. I Jessica. do have one question. I've, I've been fortunate enough to see the opera production since many times, the, since many times. <laughs> yeah, every night I'm there because I do the pre-concert lecture and I do the post-concert uh, panel. Um, so every time I watch the opera, I notice something different and beautiful and intriguing about the costumes, about the set, about the story, about the music. And um, one of the things that I was curious about, you actually uh, covered in, in your presentation about, uh, you know, her, her costume, La Catrina. Oh my God, the, the reveal of her costume, the costume is just so gorgeous and so dramatic and it's just a beautiful moment in the opera. And I always wondered what the bottom half of her dress meant and you, you know, you talked about how it's like the, the serpents, the snakes. Right. So so thank you for sharing that, because I was always wondering, I was like, there's meaning behind everything. Um, but this is a co-commission. So, you know, it went from San Diego to uh, San Francisco. And I believe after us, it's going to go to Dallas and then to L.A. Opera. And so when these costumes are going around to all these different opera companies, how does that work with the costumes? Like, do you find a singer that's going to fit the costume <laughs> or do you or do you have to remake the costume for that particular singer? No, you may have to remake the costume, obviously, for the singer. And I think that's why it's important also that, you know, you, you do have the designers going because I think a costume is something that, and that's one thing that Frida understood very well. It's something that you live, that you wear, that it's part of it's part of you. So it's not something you can impose on another person. I do feel you have to kind of, you know, make sure that it works for that singer and that they're comfortable with it. And it, I do agree that, you know, that's not a, the, the Katrina costume. It's not a very easy costume the makeup to wear so uh you know so it has to be something that she makes her own absolutely so yeah so i'm absolutely always open with a new singer to rework some things and to listen to them and and you know to bring a bit of them into and you know we i feel that we do the costume together it's not something you can impose on another person definitely so when this opera is is done touring, uh, what are you going to do with that costume and what size is it? Because <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's also the amazing job that, you know, everyone in the costume shop did and with so much love. And, you know, you can, I, I feel that, you know, you can see see all the work and all the love that was put into it and all the fun we had also. And Eloise, either at the San Diego production or here in San Francisco, were there any points where perhaps an aspect of the costume became a difficulty for the performer in a way that you had to maybe make changes? Uh, no, absolutely. I think, you know, every time you do a piece, especially in opera, um, you know, because singing is such a, you know, so uh, difficult for the body, body, simply, you know, you just have to, to be prepared to make those changes. And I think it's very important to be open to, for those. And I did do some changes and the costumes that you see in San Francisco are different from the ones that have completely new pieces um, from the ones in San Diego. You know, overall, I think we still preserve the idea and obviously the general life motifs that appear and, and the color palette. And, you know, you, you, you keep some of the essence of, of the story and what you wanted to say, but you obviously have to adapt it for for for, for the whole team and for everyone who, who is a part of this beautiful piece of art. I had uh, mentioned the other night during one of our post-performance panel discussions that uh, my favorite entrance in opera had always been Scarpia in Tosca when he comes in in act one and the music is so menacing and it's just so dramatic. Um, you have eclipsed that, my new favorite <laughs> entrance in opera. The character of La Catrina has already entered, but she is, is kind of covered up and it is that disrobing. Mm -hmm. um, and the music is so amazingly powerful. It's as if Darth Vader is entering the room. <laughs> and I guess to some extent he kind of is. Um, but so just thank you for the, the majesty of, of that moment and it is absolutely your costume in conjunction with Gabriella's music that just makes such a fantastic moment and a moment so representative of the power of opera. 
So thank you for that. And Arlene, have you done any designs for stage? And if not, are we maybe inspiring you to, to do that? <laughs> oh, no, it's so inspiring. I actually, um, Catherine Clark Gallery has a, a block blurb, which is like a project side like that, that uh, connects uh, artists with other makers. And um, I think a, about a year ago, I was able to work um, in, in collaboration with Ana Teresa Fernandez and Shinji, who is a I think he's a musician. I'm like not very well versed in, uh, in opera music and anything outside of painting and art. Um, but he is, he's a composer. That's what it is. And he is absolutely incredible. And so um, they came in with some dancers and were able to like use flashlights to activate my work and to like dance and react to the work. And it was absolutely incredible. Um, ever since that time, I've been thinking about how to create um, costumes that are like in conversation with this like hyper visible but also invisible um, aspect of being undocumented. Uh, unfortunately, I'm so busy right now that it's it's not happening. Uh, but but it is it is so super inspiring because I think there is so much power um, in what we wear. Awesome. Well, do let us know if your uh, work ends up on the stage, or perhaps we can help that happen for you. Um, we've got a question from the audience. I believe this is from our online audience, actually. And more questions to go. Um, OK, I'm going to start with this one first, because it's a, a subject we didn't touch yet. Greta Garbo stole the show. So for anyone that didn't see the opera, there is a character that is an impersonator of Greta Garbo. Um, and yeah, what a fabulous, fun character. Eloise, were you, um, I have to say, I'm not up to date on the fashions of Greta Garbo. Uh, what was the inspiration for Greta Garbo's costume? Was that based on oh, things that I, she actually Oh, I'm going to show you very quickly. Uh, am I sharing screen? Yeah. No. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> OK, there we go. OK, so actually, yes, and I read in a blog the other day that someone said she looks a bit more like uh, Norma Desmond than the Greta Garbo. And I don't necessarily even mind that because it was, I felt, you know, my homage to that, you know, era altogether. But I do feel that, you know, these are the images that I started the design with, which is, um, you know, also first we wanted it to be clear that he's an actor. So Leonardo is an actor and he's not a Greta Garbo. So I felt that the robe and, you know, a turban would be something that, you know, he can, in which he does in, um, in, uh, in San Francisco is put the turban on stage. He's, you know, appears in that, you know, wig cap. And so we wanted to be, you know, something, a costume that's a bit expresses that transition, you know, uh, you know, of becoming someone else, of maybe a robe, maybe he'll put another costume on. I really love the idea of robes, and obviously one of the designers that worked a lot with with uh, Greta Garbo was Adrian, and I felt that, you know, he had these velvet kind of robe-like things, and then she appears in this kind of Mata Hari things, and that's how, how we ended up with, uh, with that, uh, with this costume. Very cool. So yeah, but I think it's also very important to keep in mind it's not Greta Garbo, it's an actor who's who's fascinated by, by right. Garbo. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. And I just love how the question was actually worded. Greta Garbo stole the show. Please discuss. <laughs> <laughs> we just did that. And one other question. This is from Joan, who's watching us on YouTube. Who thought of the singers changing outfits on stage? And does this add difficulty to the costumes? Oh, that was Nilo Cruz, and I did say, Nilo, next time you write a libretto, please make sure <laughs> costumes are not changed on stage. Please, please don't write that in. That makes everything so complicated. And no, but I, you know, in the end, we all enjoyed it. It was wonderful, and you know, it was a way of you know representing that ritual of visiting the world of the living, and you know, changing your. Um, uh, dimension in a way so I, I you know and, and I do understand that the costumes were but it was Nilo Cruz he's the guilty one <laughs> thank you okay so we're blaming the librettist Nilo Cruz um, <laughs> we've talked a lot about the fashion and the music but I have to say that the libretto the words itself are also so powerful and so meaningful to this opera and like I said at the start of this conversation every factor of this production is just absolutely top-notch and, and what an honor and pleasure it is just to be a small part of it um, Jessica, do you have any final thoughts before we... Well, I, I'm curious if anyone has any other questions from the audience. I think one of these was from someone in the audience, but if there is a final question from someone with a loud voice, or I can repeat the question yep, for you, yes. Here. 
Oh, we got a, Robert has a microphone for you right there. Yes, uh, I have a question, a point that came up with the tour the other day. The colors of Diego Rivera's murals are said to intensify and get sharper and brighter in the first hundred years. Upon what is that based? How do they know that? I mean, certainly they oh, are wow. bright and beautiful, but are they going to continue increasing? Arlene, do you happen to know about that? I do not. Stephanie, do you know about that? About the fresco? fresco? Be yeah. I, yeah, the, the only thing, I, I really don't know much about it, except that um, I was just reading the other day that um, Diego Rivera's um, murals were painted in such a way that the colors would last. Um, so it was a different way, a different method, but I can't really add more than that. All right. So, oh, Moira's got an answer. For I have an right answer uh, because I actually went on a, on a tour uh, of one of the murals with, uh, with the local expert, actually, a couple of people here were there. And he explained that the materials that the fresco are made from are time tested and are you know materials that have been used for hundreds and hundreds of years and they are designed to intensify and clarify and become sharper over time and um, to be perfectly honest I don't remember do you remember Gabriel um, I don't remember exactly what the materials are I think it's mud or it's, it's a combination of limestone or uh, you know I'm sorry I don't remember what but I do remember it's very deliberate and that this happens with frescoes that are perfectly implemented as Diego Rivera's frescoes were now I would have to say that I did go to the MoMA and I also had the pleasure of, of having a guy there and I do know that there was a uh, restoration work done on it and there was some serious cleaning done on it so and that the colors did pop out after that as well so I do think that in, so the restorers also have some hand in you know keeping that as mm -hmm. good well mm -hmm. as, as they are in great shape yeah Absolutely. Well, I'm glad we got Diego somewhere in that conversation. <laughs> Go ahead, Jessica. I actually do have one question about costume. Um, I noticed during uh, the first act, there was a scene where Frida is singing and these other five female singers come out and one by one, they walk up to her and they pull a ribbon from her waist. And so there's this famous painting about Frida um, after she had her um, miscarriage uh, at the Ford Hospital. And, you know, it, I think it was like seven ribbons that led to the fetus and to like you know, a flower and, and so forth, right? That famous painting. That moment in the opera where the, the singers, the five females come and pull that ribbon from Frida, was that to depict that famous Frida portrait? And how did that costume work with the ribbon coming out of Frida? Well, we yeah, it, we did talk about that painting, but we also talk about the two Fridas, and we felt that she does have this light motif appearing in many different ways in different paintings. And Lorena felt very strongly that it ha we had to kind of recreate that in some way. And um, so yeah, so we did that, and I do feel that you know it works well with uh, you know that we have this theme of the ribbons uh, and the veins and the blood and you know the, those connections between the people you love and your roots, and you know it's it's something in between between veins, roots, and, and all that. So we, that, that image came. And while we, I, we also kind of tried, and which is that the, the five women are a bit, should look a bit like Frida as well. And they were the same actresses that uh, appear in the, in the act two that, yes, as the self, uh, Frida self-portraits. And it was just a you know, very simple actual mechanism of just ribbon being hidden in some pockets, really. Jessica, for anyone that is going to see our final performance on June 30th, those lucky people that have a ticket or are able to get a standing room ticket, or for those that might end up seeing a further production down the line, what is your number one tip to that viewer for this opera? Come to the pre-concert lecture. <laughs> <laughs> or listen to it online at sfopera.com. It was very interesting to, to be asked, it was an honor to be asked to be the pre-concert lecture, but to, to pull together a, a lecture for an opera that's new, you know, it's not like a Wagner or Mozart opera where you can do a lot of research and there's a lot of information and material to pull from. So I really had to do my, my research on Nilo and Gabriela and my research on Frida and, and my research on, you know, uh, this particular new production and what it means for the SF opera. So there 
there's a lot of really cool, interesting things that are happening that are monumental, that are also historic, that are extremely creative. So I incorporate all that into my pre-concert lecture, as well as some snippets of the music to cue everyone in and to let them really, you know, uh, get a feel for what they're about to experience and really understand and enjoy it to the maximum capability possible. Yes, she does. And, and thank you for that. And Arlene, uh, if, let's say there is a young person watching that is wanting to be an artist. What tip do you give them? Oh, just do it. Just do it. Yeah, I feel like, you know, regardless of what story you have, um, whether it's one similar to Frida or one that has nothing to do with Mexicanidad or Latinidad, just tell your story. Um, and I, you know, I so often see young people trying to dive into conversations of politics or conversations of, of other people. Um, and there's no need for that. We're all amazing individuals that walk the earth and we all have a voice and we all need to be heard. And as long as you follow your truth, um, you, you will be valuable to our society. Thank you so much. Well, I could so easily spend another hour speaking <laughs> with these fabulous senors, but we are past our time. Um, so let me just say a huge thank you to Dr. Stephanie J. Smith, costume designer Eloise Kazan, and artist uh, Arlene Correa Valencia, and of course our Skull and Residence co-moderating this with me, Jessica Bejarano. And to remind you that I am Cole Thomas and Reedus, both with the Commonwealth Club and San Francisco Opera's Department of Diversity, Equity, and Community. Yeah.